It's my great privilege and pleasure now to introduce today's presenters, Maura Reynolds and Kathy Stockwell. Maura Reynolds joins us today from Holland, Michigan, where she serves as the Director of Academic Advising and Associate Professor of Latin at Hope College. So she really has a superb understanding of what it means to be both faculty and advisor. Mara has been an active member of NACADA for over a decade and has served on a number of committees and task forces, including her current position as chair of our publications advisory board. Mara has served as a faculty member at our Administrative Institute, and she's written for a number of our publications, including the Working with Faculty chapter of our new advisor guidebook and a piece for academic advising today entitled Faculty Advising in a Learner-Centered Environment. Maura is a frequent presenter at Nakata conferences, where she always receives rave reviews from her participants. And our regu- excuse me, regular webcast viewers will recognize her from our recent strategies webinar. Mara, we're delighted to have you back in the webcast venue today. Kathy Stockwell is an associate dean in the Business and Service Division and the faculty advising coordinator at Fox Valley Technical College in Appleton, Wisconsin. Like Maura, she's been an active NACADA member for more than a decade. Kathy currently serves as our association vice president, and she's also president-elect, so she'll be moving into the president's chair in October. Kathy has served on the Faculty Advising Task Force and is chair of the Faculty Advising Commission. She's presented at a myriad of NACADA conferences, served as a faculty member at our summer institutes, written for academic advising today, and is a co-author of our extremely popular Faculty Advisor Pocket Guide. Kathy, we know this subject is near and dear to your heart as it is to Maura's, and we're so happy to have you with us today. I believe Maura's going to begin the presentation, so I'll turn you over to her now, and we'll get started. Thanks, Lee. It's important to acknowledge right away that our audience today is diverse. Some of you are faculty advisors, Others are administrators of an all-faculty advising system. Others are administrators of a system with professional as well as faculty advisors. Some of you are primarily advisors, but you teach a class or two every year, and still others are full or part-time advisors who don't teach in the classroom or online. Some of you, as Lee said, have attended the entire series of webinars this year, and for others, this is your first Nakata webinar. Quite diverse groups. To all welcome. As Kathy and I prepared, we tried to keep this diversity in mind, and we hope that each of you will find what we talk about today helpful. Let's begin by taking a brief look at obstacles faculty may face as we serve as academic advisors. The first obstacle. Typically, when faculty are hired or considered for tenure and promotion, we're assessed most heavily for our perceived skills as teachers and researchers. Rarely do our skills as advisors play a significant role in our assessment when we're hired, tenured, or promoted. At some colleges and universities, advising falls under the category of service as if it were equivalent to committee work rather than being counted as teaching. The result is that tangible rewards for faculty to enhance advising skills may not be present. As Ms. Mentor, a columnist in the Chronicle of Higher Education writes, extra service like advising will get you into heaven, but it won't get you tenure. Second obstacle. Faculty may not understand what advising is or what it involves. Recent handbooks written for new faculty provide a lot of helpful information about what being a professor involves, but few even mention academic advising. And older handbooks include information like this from the 1960 Handbook of University Administrators. The task of advising is concentrated in the opening days of registration and enrollment and consists of aiding students in the selection of courses. Or how about this unsettling statement that you can see on your screen and in your handout? I'll give you some time to read it. I can barely stand to speak the words out loud. Tedious clerical work, hit and run conferences, a most cordially hated activity. Oh my, 
it's hard to decide whether to laugh or to cry, isn't it? A third option is that typically faculty face increasing responsibilities and more demands on our time as budgets have decreased. We may be teaching larger classes, handling more committee work, advising more students. And even at colleges where teaching and mentoring undergrads are emphasized, we faculty are expected to be more actively involved in scholarship, publication, research with students, grant writing than we may have been in the past. Professional advisors also face more demands on their time and increased advising loads. This lack of time and increased demands are serious obstacles all of us who face as we work to reach and retain students. A fourth obstacle, we faculty are anxious about being seen as personal counselors. We're anxious about making a mistake. We're anxious about our ability to work with students whose life paths may be very different from our own. And this is a concern we may share with others who advise. So how can we faculty respond to these challenges so we can enhance student success through academic advising? Bad news first. Unless we faculty have control over how hiring, tenure, and promotion decision made, that first obstacle may remain, and advising may not be rewarded in hiring, tenure, and promotion decisions. I'll revisit this obstacle later in this webinar. It is a very serious impediment for faculty advisors. Let's tackle the areas where we faculty do have some control. First, understanding what advising involves. On your screen and in the handout is a statement from Nakata about academic advising. I'm going to take the time to read it as well because it's crucial to our understanding. Academic advising is integral to fulfill the teaching and learning mission of higher education. Through academic advising, students learn to become members of their higher education community, to think critically about their roles and responsibilities as students, and to prepare to be educated citizens of a democratic society and a global community. Hmm. This does sound much like tedious clerical work, does it? It sounds like work we faculty are in a good position to do and to do well. I want to dig deeper into this description of advising and take a look at some key words. Let's start with integral. It is quite a claim to say that advising is integral, essential, and fundamental to teaching and learning in our two and four year colleges and universities, our private and public institutions, our for profit and not for profit entities. How can we advisors make that claim? And even more important, how can advisors deliver on that claim? And what's the problem anyway with focusing advising on registration and course selection? as those handbooks suggested. Aren't those integral to teaching and learning? Well, when we advisors consider registration and class getting as our primary focus, students may see their academic experiences as a series of uncoordinated, segmented courses which bear little connection to each other. Advisors can help students see the rationale of the curriculum, the why of the curriculum, not just the what. Without this larger picture view, students may consider requirements as hoops they've got to jump through, rather than as carefully planned learning opportunities. As faculty make decisions about the curriculum, we talk about scaffolding and sequencing. We discuss the skills we intend to nurture in students. We talk about the skills students will need in graduate and professional schools, in their jobs, and in their lives. One way in which advisors are integral 
is that we help students integrate their learning. This understanding of advising puts the involvement of faculty in a very different light. The statement you see on your screen comes from 1988, and it's as accurate today as it was more than 20 years ago. To have programs and courses become coherent and significant to students requires adequate advising. And since advising involved learning, not just scheduling, it makes sense that faculty would be involved. I'm not suggesting, however, that faculty are the only advisors who can do this. All advisors who approach advising as an opportunity to support students as they integrate their learning can reach goals. As Mark Lowenstein writes, an excellent advisor does the same for the student's entire curriculum that the excellent teacher does for one course. Advising is integral because advising done well can integrate. The Reverend Cotta's description focuses on student growth. So advisors can help students grow in their understanding of their gifts and abilities and the many, many ways those gifts and abilities can be used and enhanced while they're in college and beyond. Advisors help students grow in their ability to chart a path to their goals. It's no accident that peer review chose this cover for their issue focused on academic advising. College does offer many choices and it can seem like a confusing maze. Advisors can help students chart their path. Students beginning college, as well as those who are refining their life goals, benefit from a guide who encourages them to ask and to answer difficult life questions. Someone who affirms them and challenges them to stretch themselves academically and personally. A person who takes an interest in their growth and refers them to other resources. Someone who encourages them to make the most of time in college and to work to become the best version of themselves. This is faculty advising and all advising at its best. Small wonder Robert Berndl, former president of the University of Texas at Austin and former chancellor of the University of California, writes, advising should be at the core of the institution's educational mission rather than layered on as a service. Advising, whether at two or four year colleges, at comprehensive universities or small liberal arts colleges is integral to students' growth and learning. This description, this vision of advising engages advisors, whether or not they're faculty. And advisors who are engaged are more likely to understand the work they're doing, more likely to do their work well, and more likely to foster student growth and success. We want to be confident that faculty understand what advising is and what it involves, but we need to do more. We need also to communicate this understanding of advising to our students. Many students also believe that advising is about registration and course scheduling. Learning-centered advising expects students to be actively involved in advising. And how can we have this expectation unless we communicate it to students and explain why their involvement is necessary? Advising involves more than being told what courses to take for a particular major. It's not like a spectator sport. Students cannot be passive recipients of learning-centered advising any more than they can be passive recipients of learning-centered teaching. And just as is true for teaching in the classroom, high expectations for advising encourage high achievement in growth and learning for students. Setting low expectations 
doesn't encourage students to give their best effort in advising or in any other activity. And timing is important. If we bring new students to campus over the summer for registration, do we use the words advising and registration interchangeably? If we do, we've communicated to new to college students that advising is registration. So how can we communicate this larger, richer vision of advising to faculty and to students? Much depends on our campus thoughts and the ways we communicate on each of our campuses. For some campuses, handbooks and websites may work well. Kathy will talk in a few minutes about a series of advising workshops Fox Valley Technical College uses to communicate with faculty. If advising is integral to teaching and learning in higher education, Advising should play a role in our new student orientations and our parent orientation. It should be highlighted in our recruiting brochures and websites. And if we want to change faculty and students' perceptions of advising, we need to be clear that administration and class scheduling are only small parts of what advisors do. And if those of us who are advising administrators contact faculty advisors only at registration times, we've sent an unintended message to them that advising is registration. Some campuses use a formal advising syllabus to communicate to faculty and students the purposes and learning goals of advising. An earlier webinar looked at this topic and there's a lot of information posted on the Nakata Greenhouse as well. Fox Valley Technical College provides an advising syllabus for their students and faculty, and they found it a very helpful tool for improving faculty advising. Kathy will give us the details in a few minutes. No matter what vehicle we use, we need to communicate what, what advising involves. Many campuses include in their advising handbook or advising syllabus or advising website a list of the responsibilities of advisors and the responsibilities of advisees. While such lists are useful, they suggest that advising is a chore or a duty rather than an opportunity. I wonder what would happen if we phrased the issue in this way. What benefits can students gain from advising? Or why would students want to meet with their advisor? And what are the benefits of advising for faculty? A short list of responses about why students might want to work with their advisors could include those that you see on the, your screen. To set goals, to get a big picture, to sound out an idea, and yes, to work out a class schedule. How about the benefits for faculty? Well, it seems to me the benefits are similar to those we get from teaching, to help students thrive, to help them identify the skills they're developing, to have a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to see how students learn, and to share our love of learning. I'm sure you can brainstorm other benefits of advising and add to these very short. Okay, Maura, time out. Let's get real here. This vision of advising means more work for faculty than registration does. And you've already acknowledged that increasing demands have resulted in faculty having less time to devote to advising. So where's all this extra time going to come from for our overly worked faculty members? Leave it to Lee to have a question like that. My response is we can't work harder, but we can work smarter. There is little doubt that learning-centered advising takes more time than focusing on registration issues only, if only because we need to meet with students more often. Let's take some time to look at some ideas for working smarter so that our time with students can center on the learning issues. 
We Can Work Smarter by organizing group advising sessions for the clerical parts of registration or the issues it's important for all students to think about. So for new students, a group meeting could involve to run and read a degree evaluation or how to put together a schedule. For majors, it might be how to plan for an off-campus semester or get ready for an internship or think about curricular, co-curricular activities and service activities that would enhance the major. In addition to saving faculty advisors' time, group meetings let students benefit from hearing other students' questions, experiences, and suggestions. And we can work smarter by creating handbooks or websites to include commonly needed information like how to figure out a GPA or how to withdraw class or how to transfer classes from another college or the variety of questions students on your campus typically bring to their faculty advisors. I encourage you to check out our Nakata Clearinghouse of Academic Advising Resources for links to institutions that have already done some terrific work in these areas. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Models are already available for many of these things. There's a section of the Clearinghouse, for example, devoted to advising handbooks, complete with links to handbooks in use right now for students, for faculty, and for parents. The Clearinghouse also has links online GPA calculators so students can determine on their own what grades they need to raise their GPA, to get off probation, to graduate, or to enter a selective program. The University of Texas at Austin site has links to two and four-year accredited colleges and universities throughout the United States, and students can find their descriptions of classes they may want to transfer. Directing students and faculty to these resources or putting links to them on our own sites will not only preserve our limited time, they'll ensure that students are actively involved. We can smarter by posting online plans for majors or programs with a suggested sequencing of classes if that's appropriate, as well as the rationale for the sequencing. This screenshot comes from Kansas State University's College of Business curriculum website. If we put the what of the curricula online, we'll provide faculty advisors time to talk with students about the why of the curriculum and about the integration. We can work smarter by taking advantage of technology. Degree audits or degree evaluations have removed from faculty advisors much of that tedious clerical work of tracking and given us time to focus on learning issues. We want these tools in the hands of students. This is one important way to empower them so they understand what's involved in their program or degree. If I had to pick one thing which has made advising a more engaging and attractive activity for faculty, it would definitely be the degree evaluation. We can work smarter by creating templates and questions students can think about and respond to before they meet with us. Here are some examples. Before they meet with their advisors for the first time, we could ask new to college students to respond to questions like these. In high school, what were your favorite classes? What do you consider your academic strengths? Or what do you intend to accomplish this term? Or what skills do you intend to work hardest to improve? For a mid-semester check-in, we could ask, how are you doing on reaching the goals you set at the start of the term? Or what's going well for you? Or how are you doing at improving the skills you targeted for improvement at the beginning of the term? For students who are further along in the program, these questions may get them thinking. 
What opportunities are you using in and out of the classroom to apply what you're learning to the real world? How are your college experiences preparing you for life after college? Our handout includes and other questions advisors may want to ask students to think about and respond to before they meet with us. Doing this might make it more likely that students would prepare for advising meetings and student responses would provide a foundation for continuing conversations. And these sorts of questions would send the message clearly that advisors talk about more than scheduling. I'm sure you'll come up with other thought-provoking and conversation-starting questions to use with your advisees. Students could submit responses to these questions on paper, or they could post them to a course management system so they could be easily asked for review and assessment. And documents like these would provide valuable information to a new advisor a student might have later. Again, the Nakata Clearinghouse has a section with examples of forms that other institutions have created, including some for online use. Although all of these activities will take time, all of them, in the end, will conserve our time and will involve students actively in advising. And none of them is a solo activity. Advisors can work with others. We need to focus on ways which will help us use our limited time more productively. Those of us who administer advising programs could support faculty and professional advising tremendously if we tackled as many of these things as we could. And rather than being overwhelmed by that list, let's do what we suggest to our students when they're confronted with big jobs and feel overwhelmed. Break the job down into small tasks and ask ourselves every day, what can I do today to move a little bit closer to my goal of focusing academic advising on learning? Now let's take an in-depth look at some tools being used successfully at Fox Valley Technical College to improve faculty advising. Kathy? Thanks, Mara. As Mara has explained, and as noted in a 1995 Nakata publication, faculty advising is integral to student success. Regardless of institutional mission or size, faculty are an integral part of the advising process. It is critical that faculty be involved in advising students. The research literature supports both the need and the value of faculty advising. In order for faculty advisors to engender student success, they must be effective advisors. Nakata's core values both implicitly and explicitly state the importance of professional development for advisors as key to student success. Faculty advisors interested in improving their effectiveness should seek out professional development, and institutions that value faculty advisors can convey the importance of advising by offering these sought-after professional development opportunities. At Fox Valley Technical College, a two-year technical college in Appleton, Wisconsin, we offer a 12-module advisor training series that was derived from faculty requests, but is open to all staff who have contact with students. When we began planning our formal faculty advising program in 1996, we found that faculty were eager to advise, but were, as Maura discussed earlier, not really sure what advising was all about. We knew we had to give them tools and resources to be successful, so a committee of faculty and academic counselors was formed to create a training program. The curriculum for these modules was written by this work group, and the Advising 100 series of six modules, each two hours in length, was offered in the spring of 1997. 
The Advising 200 series was developed as the result of an action plan written at the 1997 Nakata Summer Institute. Following that institute, a second work group of faculty and academic counselors was formed, and the Advising 200 series, also comprised of six two-hour modules, was offered in the spring of 1998. An overview of our training series, along with a guest login to our online course, is included in your handout. Because we understand the time constraints faced by faculty, as described by Mora, our training is offered in several different delivery formats. Instructor-led group discussions, which are scheduled on a regular basis throughout the year. An online course, which you can see on your screen, is always available. And instructional team-based or one-on-one -on -one sessions are offered on an as-requested basis. Our training and development department assists in promoting these professional development opportunities, and staff is awarded continuing education credits for completion of these training modules. Members of our advising steering committee, several of whom are faculty advisors, lead the sessions. Each participant receives a binder of resources. The sessions consist of a brief lecture about the materials, discussion, usually very lively, of advising practices, and a review of case studies, also usually very lively and thought-provoking. At the end of each session, participants are asked to complete an evaluation, and the feedback is used to make adjustments to future sessions. In addition, the curriculum is reviewed and revised on a regular basis to keep it relevant and consistent with current advising practices. The online training modules are structured similarly to the face-to-face -face sessions. Each participant receives the binder of resources. Discussion is facilitated through the discussion board component of Blackboard. Participants must answer one or two specific questions for each module and also respond to the postings of at least two of their classmates for each of the questions. Case studies are also included and require each participant to post a response and also comment on at least one other posting. We have had some very lively discussions on both the discussion board and responses to the case studies. What is included in these professional development modules? First of all, faculty advisors must understand the link between teaching and advising. As the Nakata core value state, Advisors teach students to value the learning process, to take the time to appreciate their educational experience, to apply decision-making strategies, for many of them learning how to make decisions, to put the college experience into perspective, to reflect on how this experience fits into their lives as a whole, to set priorities and evaluate events what is important to them in the here and now, and how to accomplish it. To develop thinking and learning skills. To understand how they approach things and how they make the most of their learning style. And to make choices. For some students, making choices at a higher level is a whole new experience that we, as advisors, need to help them through. As faculty advisors, we must have a clear sense of purpose about advising in the same way that we have a clear purpose when teaching. What do we want students to learn during an advising meeting? What can we do that will help them be successful now and in the future? The list on your screen, which you will also find in your handout, details similarities between good teaching and advising. I will give you a few seconds to read this list before I emphasize a few points. What this list tells us is that, as advisors, we must use the time we have with our advisees wisely, speak in terms they understand, listen to their needs, encourage them to look at issues critically, and make decisions based on facts and what they think will work best for them now and in the future. 
all pretty much the same as what we do in the classroom on a daily basis. One tool that is addressed in our training and that solidifies the link between advising and teaching is the advising syllabus. Just as in a class, the advising syllabus delineates the purpose of advising, helps students understand their role and the role of the advisor, as discussed earlier by Mara, and outlines the learning outcomes that should occur as a result of advising. The syllabus used at FETC, which you see on your screen, is included in your handout. This syllabus is given to advisees during the first meeting with their, advisee, with their advisor and is used to guide that relationship throughout the student's educational career. I will highlight for you some of the items focusing specifically on the learning outcomes. As you can see, advisor contact information is included, much like on a course syllabus. Since we use the developmental approach to advising, we have highlighted that for the students. This helps them understand our interest in both their personal and educational lives and why we ask open-ended probing questions. The responsibilities of both the advisor and the student are included so the student knows what to expect from the advisor and also what they need to do to make the most of their advising sessions. Also noted is the fact that the student needs to be invested in his or her educational career and is responsible for making decisions related to that career. The learning outcomes we chose are based on the CAS standards for academic advising. They ask the student to achieve things that are important in their lives, both personal and educational, things such as clarifying values, interests, and goals, understanding the effect of their personal and educational goal on others, knowing institutional policies, procedures, and requirements, following through on actions identified during advising sessions, developing relationships with advisors, faculty, and fellow students, and monitoring their progress toward graduation. Our advising syllabus includes a grading rubric which is based on the learning outcomes. The items chosen for the rubric are those which a group focus group felt are most pertinent to a student's success while at FETC. The rubric requires the advisor and advisee to discuss each of the items to determine whether progress has been made or the outcome has been met. Because the student knows the items on the rubric will be discussed at each advising meeting, there is an incentive to actively work on achieving those goals. Of course, not all students think this is important. However, we have found through post-meeting surveys that the majority of advising, advisees find the syllabus to be helpful and aspire to achieve the outcomes as outlined. Overall, we have found by talking to both advisors and advisees that the advising syllabus leads to better advisee-advisor relationships and makes advising meetings more efficient and effective. The advising syllabus has been used at FETC for about three years. It is revisited annually by the Advising Steering Committee, although a formal assessment of its effectiveness has not yet been conducted. Revisions are made based on anecdotal feedback received from advisors. A formal assessment of faculty advising at FETC is planned for next fall, at which time the syllabus will be assessed in depth. Now back to the components of faculty advisor professional development. What other topics should be included in advisor training? There are many subjects that are important to faculty advisor effectiveness, as reflected in the description of the FETC advisor training modules included in your handout. While all of this information is important for advisor knowledge, there are three critical areas that must be addressed. The conceptual, informational, and relational components of advising. First, the conceptual component. Those things that an advisor must understand. You can see some of these listed on your screen. 
the definition of advising, the relationship between advising and student persistence, the relationship between advising and teaching, rights and responsibilities of advisors and advisees, the role of advising in student development, and student expectations of advisors. Many of these topics are addressed in the advising syllabus, which we just discussed, underscoring the importance of that tool in working with our advisees. Next is the informational component. Those things that an advisor needs to know or know how to use. These include institutional policies and procedures, referral services, student information systems, appropriate use of support tools such as the college catalog and website, the student handbook, and the class schedule. As noted by Linda Higginson, the substantive information that academic advisors need to know falls into four groups. The internal environment, the external environment, student needs, and advisor self-knowledge. Thus, the informational piece goes beyond knowing policies and procedures and what services are offered on campus. It extends to the community as a whole and the needs of both the student and the advisor. Last, but certainly not least, is the relational component. Those things that an advisor must exhibit or demonstrate. They include decision-making skills, rapport building, interview skills, and one-on-one -on -one communication skills. How can these components be woven into advisor development? One example is the FVTC module on resources and referrals, Advising 104. This module starts with a where in the FVTC world is quiz. This quiz requires participants to answer questions about internal resources, such as veterans benefits, the multicultural center, and student employment services. Upon completion of the quiz, the answers are provided and discussed. The number of times we hear, I didn't know we had that service, or does she really do that, is phenomenal. Throughout the remainder of that module, both internal and external resources are discussed, and participants are given tips for determining when a referral should be made, how to make the referral, and to whom it should be made. This module addresses all three of the components. Conceptual, in the sense that we need to understand student development and the needs of students before we can make referrals. Informational, in that we need to know about internal and external resources before we can provide details about available services. And relational, in that one-on-one -on -one communication skills are critical in discussing referral needs with advisees. Building on these three components of academic advising, we need to coach our faculty advisors on the three types of conversations advisors should have with advisees. The first of these is conversations that are informational. These conversations cover topics such as policies and procedures, graduation requirements, important dates and deadlines, programs of study. These are critical items that need to be addressed with advisees on a recurring basis. Unfortunately, however, all too often, advising conversations stop here and do not progress to the next levels. If we assume that advising is teaching and base our advising on the developmental model, the next two types of conversations are critical to student success. The first of these is conversations about the individual student, which include discussions about their core values, their aptitudes and interests, what are their strengths? And what do they think their areas for improvement are, such as their study habits, their time management skills, and their involvement in extracurriculars? The final conversations are conversations about the future, which involve goal setting and posing pertinent questions, such as, what do you want your future to be in both your career and personal life? What steps do you need to take to make this future a reality? 
and how are you changing as a result of your education? These conversations help the advisor build relationships and get to know each advisee on a more personal level. They also prod the advisee to seriously think about what it takes to be successful now and in the future. We are fortunate at FETC to have a comprehensive professional development plan that provides a solid background in advising theory and practice. While it would be ideal for all faculty to receive this type of training prior to embarking on their role as advisors, the reality is that this does not always occur because faculty advisors play an integral role in student success. We still need to start them out on the right foot. How can institutions without a fully developed professional growth program help these advisors get started? In the Nakata Pocket Guide, a faculty guide to academic advising, there are 12 tips for good advising that can be covered in a short workshop. These tips provide an overview of what an advisor should and should not do and give them an idea about what they need to learn to be an effective faculty advisor. The first tip, it's not about you. Avoid using the first person singular. Instead, draw students out by asking them to articulate their thoughts, ideas, points of view. Tip two, know their names. There is nothing sweeter than the sound of our own names, so learn the names of advisees and use them. Doing so will create a warm, open atmosphere conducive to productive conversations. The third tip, be respectful of your advisees. Remember to be careful with information they disclose and follow the legal guidelines which are meant to encourage student independence. Determine your campus legal resources and ask questions regarding confidentiality. Tip four, listen to verbal and nonverbal cues. What students say is sometimes not what they really mean. Be alert to the nonverbal cues that body language often reveals. Tip five, ask why. Engaging students in advising conversations is not always easy. But if you remember to ask why, you will challenge them to be reflective even in short conversations. Tip six, use open-ended questions. Use who, what, when, and where questions rather than those that can be answered with a simple yes or no. Encourage students to explain their thought processes. Tip seven, be available. Establish clear ways advisees can contact you. Schedule your office hours and at times when students are most likely to be on campus and be there during those times. Let them know any other ways you can be contacted as well. The eighth tip. Learn your institution's basic policies, procedures, requirements, rules, and regulations. There is no way around it. This information forms the foundation upon which advising relationships are built. Tip nine, learn your campus resources. Administrative offices and the people who oversee advising at your institution can be best allies. Get to know the staff, find out their direct phone numbers and email addresses. These people are your lifelines in helping figure out degree requirements, translate policies and procedures, and helping you contact campus offices and services that are resources for students. Tip 10, never guess. If you don't know the answer to students' questions, admit it and make a point of finding the right answers or referring students to the appropriate office. Do not perpetuate the institution's runaround reputation. Keep handy a list of campus resources along with their telephone numbers, email addresses, and contact people, as already noted in tip nine. Tip 11, set limits. 
While it is important to be available, you do not have to be available all the time. There are advisees who seem constantly to be at your office door to complain, seek sympathy, or find a familiar comfort. For these frequent visitors, set limits. And the last tip, embrace technology. If you have a large advising load and need to communicate information relevant to all students, consider using alternative strategies and technologies familiar to students. These short and sweet tips, discussed during a lunch and learn type session, give new faculty advisors a flavor of what they need to know and do as an advisor. And while they do serve to get the advisors up and running, they are not a substitute for more in-depth advisor training, which all institutions are encouraged to provide for their faculty advisors. As Richard Light noted in his book, Making the Most of College, Good advising may be the single most underestimated characteristic of a successful college experience. The knowledge we share, the relationships we build, and the support and encouragement we provide to our students as faculty advisors are integral to their success. We need to provide our faculty with the tools and resources they need to be effective advisors so they can help advisees meet their goals and be successful in both educational pursuits and life pursuits. Now, back to Maura. Thanks, Kathy. We've talked about a vision of learning-centered advising that can be presented as an engaging activity. We've explored some ways to make the most of our time, and we've just looked at some specific tools we may want to use. Now let's look at some of those other concerns or obstacles faculty have about advising. One concern is that we may feel we don't know enough about the curriculum or the institution to advise well, especially when we're asked to advise newer students whose academic interests lie outside our own disciplines. Again, we need to keep in mind that advising means more than registration and course scheduling. So if students' concerns involve things, we can refer them to online materials or handbooks or to faculty in the areas they're considering. Our advising work with students centers on helping them to reflect on and assess their gifts and encouraging them to stretch themselves and make the most of their time in college. And we can do that for all students, regardless of their discipline. As we work with new students, we probably should keep in mind that we're probably the first professor they've ever spoken with face-to-face. -face. And they might make some generalizations about all faculty based on their experiences with us. So let's make those encounters positive. Another faculty concern is that students expect we'll have all answers for all their questions. So we may be asked to field questions about financial aid or billing or complicated requirements we don't quite understand ourselves. If we faculty aren't able to answer advisees' questions, I encourage our faculty to admit it and say, I don't know. Let's find out. This response tells students several important things. First, that smart people like faculty don't know everything. And second, that when smart people don't know the answers, they talk to others. I can't imagine more important messages to send to students, especially new to college students. If we faculty have a short list of resources, as Kathy mentioned, we can figure out whom to ask. In addition, we may be anxious about advising students whose life goals are very different from our own. Many of us faculty liked college so much that we've never left it, and we have little or no work experience outside higher education, and we may be worried about advising students whose aim in life is not an advanced degree and teaching in college. An important part of advising involves connecting students with resources so they can make wise and informed decisions. Advise whether faculty or professional cannot and should not be students only resources. 
so, we can encourage students to visit the career office, ideally before the second semester of their senior year, so students can work with professionals who are probably more knowledgeable about the world of work than we may be. I found the career transition columns in Psychology Today very helpful as I work with students. Written by Katherine Brooks, the Director of Liberal Arts Career Services at the University of Texas at Austin, the columns are aimed at students, but they've helped me understand questions I should be raising with my advisees to help them get ready for the world of work. A link to these career transitions columns is included in the handout. They're online, they're short, well-written, and thought-provoking pieces. Another obstacle faculty feel is that we're concerned about being perceived as personal counselors, especially since most of us have no training in this area. But because we've shown an interest, students may come to us to talk about family concerns, mental health issues, test anxiety, and lots more. A recent article in the Nakata Clearinghouse offered some wonderful scripts for these situations. The authors suggest we use words like these when students confide about personal problems we're not equipped to help with. College can be a stressful time, and it seems like the problems you're facing might not go away. Our Counseling Center is a great resource, and the staff there are trained to help students deal with issues like what you're facing. When we use words like this, we're in acknowledging students' concerns and also pointing them in the direction of others who have the training and experience to help them and the time to do the necessary follow-up. I've included a link to this Clearinghouse article in the handout. The article, again, is short and well-written, gives wonderfully realistic about the referral process, including these extensive scripts. I recommend it highly. Another short article, this one from Nakata's Academic Advising Today, suggests useful scripts for other situations. For example, to students who have little experience making decisions or who want us to tell them what to do, we can say, I can suggest advantages and disadvantages, but the decision is yours. Or to students who have a long list of concerns and don't seem to be able to prioritize, we might say, it sounds like you have a number of concerns and questions. What are you most concerned about? Helping faculty by providing these kinds of scripts will help them be more effective advisees. Each of these short scripts involves students actively in advising decisions. Each encourages thought and reflection. Each puts students in the driver's seat. The link for this very, very short article, which is also thought-provoking, is included in the handout. Again, I'm sure each of us can come up with additions to the scripts the authors provide. The Nakata DVD, Scenes for Learning and Reflection, is another fine resource for faculty. It contains 10 short three-minute vignettes centered on advising issues faculty and professional advisees deal with. These and the discussion questions which accompany them can help faculty develop our own scripts as we work with students. It's tempting to compile quite a bibliography of resources for faculty advisors. Tempting, but probably inappropriate, since it's unlikely we'll have the time to read them. Instead, let's focus on the vision, the big picture, and target the components of the vision as appropriate rather than all at once, which can overwhelm faculty. Kathy has suggested ways Fox Valley Technical College has addressed this challenge through a series of workshops. Let's remember that often brief conversations or a sentence or two at a department or faculty meeting or some quick references during a presentation can also be effective at spreading this broader, richer vision of advising. 
these brief mentions can add up to a lot of useful communication. And this sort of communication is what's needed to win over both the hearts and the minds of faculty. And it's the vision of learning-centered advising we want to keep at the forefront. A colleague recently remarked that we need to keep our vision in focus and not police the boundaries so much that we forget where we're going. We cannot control, after all, how faculty respond to this vision of advising. We cannot force faculty to approach advising in the ways these, this webinar has suggested. And spending our time complaining about faculty advisors is not productive for us and does absolutely nothing to encourage faculty involvement. Our work is to present advising as what it is, time-consuming, anxiety-provoking, and exceptionally rewarding, even if it is unrewarded. If we're going to work well and cooperatively with faculty, we need to understand that most faculty want to do our work well, and that faculty may face substantial obstacles when we serve as advisors. Perhaps one reason advising plays little in the evaluation of faculty is that its importance is simply not understood, and it continues to be considered a service rather than integral to our work as faculty. We need to do what we can to present a vision of advising centered clearly in the teaching and learning missions of our institutions. Until that happens, faculty advising may continue to be undervalued. So we have a lot to do. Probably for most of us faculty, there were people somewhere in our academic lives who showed an interest in us. People who asked a question that really got thinking. Somebody who made an offhand comment about our potential that stuck with us. These people made a difference in our lives and perhaps even shaped our decision to pursue an advanced degree and to teach in college. Now it's our turn to make a difference in students' lives, and probably at times and under circumstances, we least expect this to happen. In the end, this is what advising comes down to, caring enough about our students and their learning to do our work well. Our departments, our deans, our institutions, us for the research we conduct and the contributions we make to our professions. This is right. This is as it should be. Often, however, our greatest satisfaction as faculty members comes from work with students. And advising offers wonderful and rich ways to work with students. Quite a vision. Lee, I'll pass the mic back to you for the question and answer segment. Thanks, Mara. All right, let's look at the questions that have come in. Um, if we aren't able to get to your specific question today, we have included Kathy and Mara's email address in your handout. So uh, feel free to email them after the event. Okay, let's start with this one. Um, Kathy, let's have you take first crack at it, and then we'll see if Mara has anything to add. Here's the question. Since the vehicles for rewarding faculty for advising are so limited, do you use any type of award such as Advisor of the Year to highlight faculty advisors? And if you do use them, how do they work to recognize good faculty advisors? And if you don't use them, why not? Kathy? Yes, we do have an advisor, an outstanding Advisor of the Year award here at Fox Valley Technical College. We award it in the spring at our staff recognition event. And the really nice thing about that is that the nominations come from both students and staff. 
And actually, over the last few years, the bulk of the nominations and very nice ones have come from students. And that really makes the faculty advisors feel good when they see what the students have written about them. Uh, the outstanding advisor here, then a nomination is sent to Nakata for the national or the annual award. And we actually have been very fortunate that over the last 10 years, five of our faculty advisors have been recognized by Nakata. Interestingly enough, we did a survey uh, about two months ago, just a very brief survey of our faculty advisors, and we found out that while they really like the Outstanding Advisor Award, it is not critical to their need and want to be good advisors, which I was really surprised that it, it didn't rank higher uh, for them. We also recognize our all of our faculty advisors with an annual luncheon or breakfast or something along those lines and then give them a small token of our appreciation as well. Mara, anything to add? I don't. We don't use uh, an advising award as such, but we have a number of teaching awards and often advising plays in those. All right, another one of our viewers has noted that neither of you talked about assessing or evaluating faculty advising, and they're wondering why you didn't include that topic and what your thoughts are on it. Mara, you want to start us off on this one? That's the topic of a whole other webinar, isn't it? That's quite a, an undertaking. I think the kinds of preparation we would need to do before a program can be assessed are absolutely essential. So until there is a clear understanding of what advising is and the learning goals for advising, assessing the program or the individual advisor would be meaningless. So I would encourage people who are interested in looking at assessment issues, again, there's a section in the Nakata Clearinghouse about that, but I think the process of, of assessment needs to come after there's a common understanding of advising, after there are learning goals set. Otherwise, it becomes an activity that looks, I think, very much to faculty anyway, like an assessment that that's not being conducted fairly because they don't know what the rules are. So I, I would agree with Mara, and it took us many years to feel that we were in a place where we could do an assessment. And also, it's just been in the last few years that we include the faculty advising piece in faculty performance reviews with their deans. Kathy, you just mentioned a minute ago that the advising award wasn't as high on the list of, of uh, what the faculty valued as you might have expected. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, there's an article coming up in Academic Advising Today that's written by um, Vicki McGillan and, and some other folks from the Faculty Advising Commission that talked about some review work that they did following up on some uh, assessment that Jane Drake did a couple of years ago. And I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, they said that they found give, being given uh, support staff and maybe some release time and other things like that were what uh, were considered most uh, rewarding to the, the faculty that they considered. What ranked highest for your faculty? They are right on. Uh, they like the support from administration and also support staff to assist them in uh, doing, you know, the, the few clerical things, type things that need to be done. They also like the release time. You know, what they really like the most, though, was for administration to recognize their work by saying, geez, you know, we really appreciate what you're doing for the students. And they also appreciate the really nice comments they get from the students. Those were the things that ranked the highest for them. Kathy, how do you get your most seasoned faculty to participate in the training that you've discussed? 
Good question. And I honestly don't have an answer for that because when we first started the training, what, 13 years ago, it just seemed like it was the thing to do. And we trained approximately 300 people in all 12 modules in about a year and a half's time. Now, all new faculty are exposed to the training um, during their uh, new employee orientation, and they're required to come and meet with me, which probably doesn't hurt. But the majority of them also sign up for training within a short time after being hired. Kathy, another one I think um, for you, you talked about the three types of conversations that we need to have, and I just want to make sure that we've clarified because uh, this question makes me wonder if there's some confusion. Uh, the question is, in order to cover those three types of conversations, how long would an advising session need to last? Um, did you intend to convey that they would all be covered in one session? Uh, not necessarily, but, you know, really you can – you know, by asking certain questions from each of those groups or conveying informational types of things, it really doesn't have to be a long conversation and you can really hit on all three areas, but not necessarily. Some meetings with advisees may be just informational, you know, and others may be more looking at the goals, you know, what is it you really want, and so those kinds of things. Another viewer would like to know if um, there are any materials that faculty um, are required to, or requested to provide for annual review uh, of their advising. Mara, do you have anything along those lines? We do not. Beyond um, at HOPE, they're asked to provide the number of advisees that they have. But beyond that, they don't provide other information. So at tenure and promotion uh, decisions, there are often letters from advisees in their uh, credentials file. Kathy? We're pretty much the same. They all discuss, you know, how many advisees they have and if they've gotten any really good notes or anything from students, they will bring those. A lot of times those emails or handwritten notes are sent right to the dean, so they go right into the faculty member's file. So, But otherwise, you know, we don't really have anything other than just a discussion of how it's going. Okay, here's the question that is always asked. Let's talk about numbers. What, what's your advisee load, and what's a typical advisee load for faculty? Here at Fox Valley Tech, it ranges anywhere from probably 15 or so to well over 100. But those with the very large numbers are the programs for instance, nursing, where they really are on pretty much of a set schedule. The basic, the informational needs can be handled in group advising sessions. Then that really takes the load off in terms of individuals. We also use peer advisors here, which really, really helps lighten the load, particularly in those programs with fewer faculty and, and higher numbers of students. Mara? Our requirement is 20 advisees. Um, and because we have a first year seminar, which faculty teach uh, and is 20 students, a limit of 20 students, faculty who are teaching the first year seminar have no problem getting that number. Um, just as at Fox Valley, we have some programs, certainly not 100, but I'd say closer to 40. Some departments with extremely popular majors would have that number of declared majors. The chair is the person that assigns advisors when to declare their majors. And my hope always is that the chair is in the best position to know uh, what responsibilities that faculty member already has on his or her plate. So there might be someone that 
uh, is working on a on, ex, on an extensive grant or research program that my, the department chair might decide to shield a little from advising for a while. So in some cases, there can be a little bit of an imbalance. But I think because the chairs assign advisors, I think they're in a better position to know than I am how to assign advising responsibilities. Okay, I know that varies, and that kind of gives a segue to another question that we have. Um, that that word required um, and that specific number. Some faculty are maybe a little bit better at this than others. Some are more interested in doing it than others. When there is a situation where there is a requirement, students may want to work with the faculty who are more inclined towards it and maybe not work with some of the others. So how do you deal with that imbalance? Maura, since you used that term, let's have you start with that. See, I know, knew I shouldn't have used it. I think the important thing is to have multiple sources of, of information and consultation for students. So uh, although I myself have a lot of these, I also see a lot of students for a variety of reasons. In some cases, the students need an answer right away and their advisor isn't available. In some cases, they're not 100% comfortable with their advisor. The other thing is we make it um, very easy for students to change their advisor. They, it's not a complicated process. It's a three-line form, and all they need to do is ask the new faculty member um, to be their advisor. Uh, life is unfair, I think, sometimes. There are some people who are better at it than others. I think it's an important part of a teaching responsibility. I know that the more I talk with faculty and am able to connect advising with teaching, the more likely it is that they'll see it that way. But I think the important thing is to keep in mind that we want the student to get the help and advice they need. And if that, at least as far as I'm concerned, if that involves um, more work for me, I'm prepared to do that um, to make sure that the student gets the help and advice that student needs. We do not require faculty to advise. So in each of the uh, majors, those faculty who only those who want to advise do, and that seems to work out very well. All right, we have just a couple more questions um, that we might be able to look at very quickly that are about specific Things. One uh, viewer wants to know about incorporating advising into orientation, and another wants to know about online advising. Do either of you um, have any specifics that you would like to speak to those topics? Yeah, I think in terms of our communication, especially with incoming students and their families, we need to make very clear to them in the kinds of messages we communicate with them, whether they're online messages or in-person messages, what students can can get, what, what the benefits of advising for students are. Uh, and there are many. I, I have a lot of contact with incoming students. It's easy for me to talk to them and send them information about advising. I also run sessions during our student and parent orientations that are about uh, advising. And because we have the luxury of a first-year seminar, uh, an academically-based first-year seminar, advisors who teach those seminars can embed the information about advising into the seminar and liberal arts and skills and all those kinds of things that are so important for new to college students to understand. I think many times embedding that information in another structure is, is the most effective way to communicate. Kathy, we have about 30 seconds if there's anything you'd like to add. We uh, introduce advising to our students during new student orientation. Uh, they are able to meet their faculty advisor. And because many parents are also there, I think that reinforces with them as well, as Mara said, the importance of advising. 
All right, excellent. Our time is up. Uh, it looks like we were able to cover pretty much all of at least the subject matter of the questions that came in. But again, if you um, have any questions that you felt didn't get answered today, please feel free to email Kathy or Maura afterwards. We would like to thank Maura and Kathy for sharing their expertise with us today. You've done a tremendous job of gathering and organizing all the material for this broadcast, and we really appreciate your willingness to share your experience and your insights with us. Kathy, Mora, on behalf of the association, thank you for all that you've done to put together today's presentation. And again, we thank all of our participants for being with us today and throughout this season of broadcasts. And we look forward to interacting with you again beginning in September for the 2010-2011 season. If you have any questions about this broadcast or future events, please be sure to visit the Nakata website or feel free to contact me directly by phone or email. We look forward to seeing you next time.